Hi there, friends. Uh, we'll begin the discussion of the Gospel of John, chapter 8, in about five minutes. And uh, please feel free to leave any comments, thoughts, ideas, questions, uh, prayer requests, and we'll get started soon. Hi, George Ann, and Rita, Tim, Edith. How is everybody tonight? I posted a few uh, things. One is a link to a book that uh, some of us at Living Water read together uh, called, I can't remember now, How the Bible Came to Be, or how, I can't remember the exact title, but you'll see the link. Also, uh, I just linked to a, a Wikipedia article on the women's court, which is one of the courts of the temple, uh, which is the setting for some of John 8. We'll get to everything in a, in a minute here. Well, good evening, and I'm uh, glad you're able to be here, and I'm looking forward to our time together tonight. Hi, Linda. Hi, Nancy. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, prayer requests, I think I've figured out how to keep up with uh, comments that come in, so uh, that'll be good. So it is Maundy Thursday evening. If you haven't had an opportunity to... Uh, uh, to go to the Living Water YouTube channel, we have Maundy Thursday worship posted there. 
Good Friday worship will be available around noon tomorrow. And then Easter Sunday worship will be available on the YouTube channel um, at 7 a.m. on Easter Sunday. But we will have uh, special editions of the wave going out to members of the of Living Water uh, with the precise links. And uh, I thank everybody who comes to that and participates in worship in that way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now that your spirit would once more guide our discussion and that uh, brought to you by the Father, uh, Lord Jesus, you would help us to trust in you. And Lord, we pray now that uh, uh, this study would bear fruit for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. I wanted to make mention, I did send out a prayer request, but uh, Warren's, I'm not going to use last names. I did that the other day. I shouldn't. Uh, Warren's sister, who lives in Connecticut, uh, works for one three-hour shift a week at a medical clinic, um, has uh, been confirmed to have uh, coronavirus along with the three people she works with. She and her husband are um, presently in quarantine. Their name are Ruth and Gary. And uh, she does have some symptoms, but not a fever yet. Gary and Mary Ann's son, all right, Greg, his father-in-law, who is 90, whose first name is Andre, um, is in the hospital with coronavirus uh, here at uh, Miami Valley. So um, there are a lot of people to be praying for and a lot of protection to be sought in these uh, difficult times. You may have noticed that um, somewhere <laughs> in the material associated with with this uh, with with this particular live cast, uh, you will find the link to a, a book you can get either as a Kindle or as a paperback on how the Bible was formed. And I'll explain the reason why I um, uh, suggested you might want to look at that book uh, or purchase it because it's very reasonably priced and is very informative. Um, in just a minute. I also posted a Wikipedia article in the comments about the so-called Court of the Women or the Women's Court at the temple um, in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, the first century temple, uh, first century AD temple. And um, hi there, Deb. And um, uh, that, that's an important setting, and we'll get into some details on that. Um, the reason for bringing up the whole question of how the Bible has come to us or um, was formed is that um, we have multiple manuscripts. Let's just confine ourselves right now to the Greek or the New Testament texts. I'm not going to talk about the Old Testament te uh, Old Testament manuscripts right now. Um, we have numerous, about 10,000 manuscripts of uh, fragments of the New Testament um, dating as early as the third century. And uh, remember how the Bible was passed on or the, the books or the letters that comprise the New Testament were passed on. Um, first of all, a hi, Dick. Good to see you. <laughs> all right. Great. God bless. Um, so at any rate, uh, what happened was that the original writers, be they the gospel writers or Paul or Peter, um, or the author of Hebrews, um, 
they would have had what was known as an amanuensis, a secretary, who would listen to the apostle or the, the writer um, dictate, and then those copies would be uh, distributed among churches. Uh, usually uh, they would uh, 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 arise in particular regions, for example, you know, uh, Paul's letter would go to uh, went to the Corinthians, went to Corinth and the uh, Greek peninsula or Greek, I don't know what you call that, archipelago, whatever it is. And I guess it's a peninsula and it has an archipelago. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it, it would go to them and then people would so value it that it would be copied and copied and copied. And later on, of course, this was the full-time job of some monks. Well, what happens is uh, in, in the course of this transmission, it's a little bit like playing a game of telephone, uh, usually without any kind of agenda or um, ill intent, um, something would get copied wrong, and then the next person would copy that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes there were certain theological emphases um, words that might carry a certain amount of freight um, in one region might not carry that same freight in another. It might There might be slight alterations to it. So we have all of these manuscripts of New Testament writings, and they fall into different family trees. And we know some manuscripts are vastly more reliable than others. And so the job of a scholar, um, New Testament scholar, a translator, is to decide, okay, does this really belong in the Bible or not? Now, when you uh, read your New Testament, depending on the translation that you read, you'll find some passages uh, of the New Testament are not as well attested as others or there is some dispute over their inclusion. Uh, you have that in Mark 16, for example. There are questions as to whether John 21 was originally part of John's gospel. We'll talk about that issue when we get to John 21. Um, and here in John 8, there is a dispute about a very beloved incident that occurs um, in the first 11 verses of John 8. Um, the earliest manuscripts and even the most conservative uh, New Testament theologians will tell you this, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include this. That isn't to say that it didn't come from John. That isn't to say that it's not true. It's just that they um, want to be honest and forthright with you and tell you this is not as well attested, say, as the rest of John 8. I don't think it's going to hurt us to read it. <laughs> and it also uh, contains a very important truth about Jesus within it. So uh, let's take a look now at John 8. And in um, my particular translation, which is the English Standard Version, which is what's used, I can't hold this properly, in the Lutheran Study Bible. There we go. The Lutheran Study Bible, published several years ago by Concordia Publishing House. It begins with chapter 7, verse 53. So, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, uh, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. 
And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Hi, Jack. I don't think I greeted you. Good to see you here. Say hello to Diane and your family, your household there. Uh, this incident, uh, it, remember, the, the Feast of Booths is still going on. Jesus has retired to the Mount of Olives, which is a really important place in biblical history. While everyone else went back to their homes, remember the Son of Man does not have a home or a place to lay his head, Jesus says in one of the other Gospels. So he spends the night at the Mount of Olives. But early uh, the next morning, he goes back to the temple and he's teaching there. And uh, John uh, tells us that he sat down and taught them. This was the characteristic way for uh, rabbis, teachers, to teach. The students would stand and the teacher would sit. The word um, for um, seat in Latin is cathedra, from which we get the word cathedral. So the cathedral is the place where the bishop sits and teaches the normative faith, teaches the gospel. Um, so, to, uh, so if we're uh, teaching today to come from the Pope, it says ex cathedra. This means this is the Pope acting in his papal office. Uh, so that comes from this custom of the religious teachers sitting down and teaching. And uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, remember, they're already intent on killing Jesus. That was established a year before. But at this point, they, they want to try to trump up some evidence, try to find some way to trap him, to snag him, snare him. And so they're, what they want to do is uh, pit Jesus against Moses. Remember in the exchange that occurred uh, the day before, um, there, there's this dispute about, uh, about uh, whether, you know, what he proclaims is consistent with what Moses taught. And he is saying Moses pointed to him. Well, anyway, uh, they bring this woman who's been caught in adultery. Now, Living Water folks, you've heard me say this many times. <laughs> it is, it is uh, uh, a, a very interesting point that they didn't bring the man caught in adultery. They only brought the woman. Uh, apparently, they, they must have let the man go scot-free. But they decided that they would use her as an object lesson and say to Jesus, you know, Moses' law said that anyone caught in adultery should be stoned to death. Now, you have this very curious thing of Jesus uh, in verse 8. Well, it, 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 first of all, he's, it's, it's mentioned in uh, verse 6 that he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And then in verse 8, once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. Uh, it is not clear what exactly Jesus is doing. But there are uh, many scholars over time who believe that what he was doing was writing the sins of the world in the dust and the ground. Um, <clears throat> in any case, the words that he speaks to them carries the same freight. Because, you know, in, if he is writing the sins of the world in the ground, there in the dust, uh, that would mean that he is uh, saying, you know, you're not really in a position to judge someone else for sinning because you too are sinners, which is what he says 
in verse <clears throat> 7, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Uh, I, I've often speculated whether in this time, if Jesus said that to a crowd of people today who were intent on judging a human being, whether they would walk away or whether they would just start throwing stones. It seems to me that we live in a time where we have fewer standards, but because we have no standards, we're, we're more judgmental. In other words, the standards change by the day according to political correctness, and political correctness can come from the left wing, the right wing, or no wing. It doesn't matter. It's, it's kind of the... Uh, flavor of the day of, of, of what we think is wrong and what we think is right and whatever makes us feel good, whatever makes us feel that we're not as bad as the people we're, we're railing against. So I really wonder if, if people today wouldn't just start hurling stones at this woman convinced that they're without sin. Because so often when I talk with people about the gospel who are outside the faith, they can't understand what Jesus came to save us from. Uh, they have no notion of their sin. But here it says, beginning with the oldest, uh, probably because they're wiser, they dropped their stones and walked away. And then Jesus proclaimed to her, uh, sin no more, go and from, and from now on sin no more. Deb, I tarry if you're there, I'll never forget the class, adult Sunday school class at Bethlehem, when Earl, after we read this passage, from now on sin no more or go and sin no more, he said, well, who can do that? <laughs> and the uh, answer is no one who is not Jesus could walk away and sin no more. But if we don't walk away from confessing our sins and receiving the forgiveness of God through Jesus, if we don't walk away with the intention of not sinning again, then we probably really haven't repented. All right. We're already 22 minutes into this thing, and uh, I got to get moving and grooving. Verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them. Said, by the way, at verse 12, we come to the undisputed beginning or the undisputed portion of uh, chapter 8. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This echoes the words in uh, John 1 that says that Jesus is the light of the world. The darkness has not overcome it, and in him was the life of the world. Okay. So the Pharisee said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not where I uh, do not know where I come from or where I am going. Remember, they had this argument last night. They have no idea where he's come from. Jesus knows where he's coming from or has come from. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. This is an important point. Jesus Christ, in, in truth, Jesus does not judge us. We judge ourselves. <clears throat> if we spurn Jesus, as I mentioned a few nights back, then we are standing naked in our sin, and we're left to be judged on the basis of the standards that we try to put other people under. But if we trust in Jesus, we are judged according to the standard of his behavior because he covers us with his righteousness. So Jesus does not judge us. We judge ourselves. We condemn ourselves by rejecting the Savior of the world. Verse 16, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. 
These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour, there it is again, had not yet come. Now, what's going on here, of course, is the old Jewish rule that you have to have uh, two or three uh, witnesses to something testifying that uh, something is true. And the Pharisees, again, trying to snag Jesus, snare Jesus, say, wait a minute, you're testifying for yourself. And Jesus points back to the fact that, no, the Father is also bearing witness for me, but my witness is okay, too, because I speak the truth. Remember, too, that John the Baptist said earlier in the gospel that he heard the witness of the Father, that this was the Messiah. So we have multiple witnesses. We've had others since saying this must be the Messiah. So Jesus isn't just witnessing for himself, but he's saying even with just the Father and me, there are two witnesses who will tell you who I am and will testify about me. Now, um, about this place, the the uh, treasury, also it's, it's around the women's court of the temple, um, uh, uh, Pastor Bruce Shine in his book, Following the Way, this is uh, my seminary professor and mentor, um, his book on the Gospel of John, uh, he writes this about the setting of this incident. Uh, Meanwhile, a crowd is gathered in the women's court, also called the treasury, because of the trumpet-shaped collection boxes placed at its entrance to listen to his inspiring message. There could be no better place for a popular preacher to gather a congregation. In this area, all of God's people, male and female, Judean, Samaritan, Galilean, Greek, Nazarene, and even the lepers who come here for certification that they are healed can hear his message. So Jesus has chosen the spot, and I'll uh, I'll post a link to this book, although it's rare as hen's teeth, but I'll post a link to it anyway uh, after we're done. Uh, this if Jesus could not have picked a better spot to project his message there at the temple. And there are all kinds of people there where the Pharisees want to trap him there as well. But his hour has not come. And so we go on to verse 21. So he said to them again, now here... Uh, We talked about how things are escalating. Things really get escalated here in this chapter. And Jesus is not giving up his argument. So much for this meek um, Jesus who can be pushed around. Verse 21. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin where I am going you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I want to stop right there. Literally, what Jesus says at this point is not uh, that I am he. Rather, he says that I am. He uses the phrase, you don't believe I am. That I am. Uh, Of course, I am, ego me in the Greek, translates the Hebrew Yahweh, God's name, the one that he gave to Moses at the burning bush, Yahweh. Who who shall I say sent me, uh, Moses asks, when he's told to go to the Pharaoh. Tell them, I am sent you. And in the Hebrew, Yahweh means, I am who I am. I was who I was. I will be who I will be. Uh, The point is that this God is the foundational noun and verb from which all of creation springs. I am. And that's going to be a very important phrase in this chapter too. And uh, Jesus is claiming that mantle for himself. He is not mincing any words. 
He is Yahweh in the flesh. All right. So they said to him, who are you? <laughs> More cluelessness because he just told him I am. <laughs> who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my authority, own authority, but speak just as the father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So we've seen this kind of ebb and flow. People believing in him, people deserting him, people believing in him. You know, people disputing with him. Jesus is always a bone of contention. We mentioned that in chapter 7. Now, I want to go back to this, his use of this phrase, I am. There are four places in the Gospel of John. I mean, there are places where Jesus says, I am he, or I'm, I'm the good shepherd, I'm this. But there are four places where he explicitly identifies himself as Yahweh, as I am. And this one we read just a moment ago is uh, one of those places. And he's saying, you don't get me because you are so mired in this world. You pay no attention to the Father. You pay no attention to the Word of God. You pay no attention to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. How could you believe that I am? You are of this world. Now, this is not how to win friends and influence people on Jesus' part. This is him telling the truth. Oh, by the way, I've I've not been uh, checking. If you've got any questions or or anything uh, along the way, just just type them out there in the comments, and I'll catch them. Verse thirty-one. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, "If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples." And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When Jesus speaks of the truth, he's not speaking of an abstraction. He is the truth. That's what he says in John 14, verse 6. I am the, tr uh, the way, the truth, and the life, right? For Jesus to be the truth is for him to be what the uh, Lutheran theologian uh, of the last century, Paul Tillich, called... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, I'm going to forget the phrase, the foundation of being, right? The ground of being, right? Uh, it, it, and it also means that he is, uh, uh, the canon, the measuring stick by which all truth, uh, truth claims are to be measured. Uh, the reason that the Bible passes muster is that it points faithfully to Jesus and, and who he was and what he said. It would not be holy if it weren't pointing to Jesus. And so, but what he's saying is that if you know him, you will know the truth. If you abide in him, that's that same word we talked about over and over again in the Gospel of John. Menain, remain, stick, stay, right? If you stick with me, you'll know the truth. Verse 33. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? <laughs> well, it, the whole history of Israel is, is one of slavery. The people have always been slaves, right? There was 430 years of slavery in Egypt. There was, you know, they were under slavery not now under the Romans. So they're living in complete denial. The minute that a Christian or the word of God or a Christian speaking the word of God tries to tell people that they are in bondage to sin and cannot free themselves, they insist that they're free. Because if they actually have to acknowledge 
that they're in bondage to sin, then they will have no choice but to turn to a Savior. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Well, that's everybody. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Oh boy. So this is a big time insult again. But what Jesus is saying is, if you're a slave, you have no rights in the household. But if you're the son, you always have the household, right? Even Prince Andrew <laughs> still is a member of the royal house in the United Kingdom, even though he's a goomba, right? He has not been disowned. Well, Jesus is the son who always has the inheritance. And of course, he can share that inheritance with us. He says later in the Gospel of John that he's going to build many rooms for us. In my father's house are many rooms. and I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, so here we have uh, the, the contrast between a slave. A slave can be sold. A slave can just be left out in the cold. Right. But the son always has rights. And he's saying, if, if you're if you were the offspring of Abraham, you would welcome me. But he's saying also they have a different father. Verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You were doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you un not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. These were people who were, briefly anyway, his disciples. But they couldn't stand at the, the thought that they were slaves to sin who could not free themselves and that they needed Jesus in that way. They believed in him without really understanding at this point what it meant to believe in him. And as he unpacked it for them, they became increasingly offended by him. Now, Remember, they begin by saying Abraham is our father. And then when the stakes get higher, they say God is our father. Um, there are only a few passages in the Old Testament where God is referenced as father. Um, this is why Jesus giving us the Lord's prayer is fairly revolutionary, because what he does is he shares with us the same relationship with God the father that he has. And he privileges us with that through our faith in him. He says, if you were Abraham's children, you'd be doing the works that Abraham did. Well, what were the works that Abraham did? Genesis 15, 6 tells us that Abraham believed and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Those were the works of Abraham. He trusted in God. Perfectly? No, we can name some incidents where he didn't. But when uh, Abraham fell, he knew to return to God as well. So the works of Abraham are to trust in God. 
and Jesus is saying, here is God standing before you and you don't believe in me. And then they pull out the big guns in verse 41. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. There were a lot of reports during Jesus' days on the earth that he was an illegitimate child, that Mary had him out of wedlock uh, as a result of a, a human father. You can understand no one had ever been born of a virgin before. You can understand why people would have spread that fake news. Huh? Um, so they're really coming back at him. Jesus doesn't care about that. He comes back to them and says they don't understand what he says because they cannot bear to hear his word. Turn real quickly, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, uh, 14 rather. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul writes this, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If a person is not open to the testimony of God about who Jesus is as our Savior and Lord, everything Christians say is like, you know, the parents in the Charlie Brown or the adults, all the adults in the Charlie Brown movies, wah, 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 they can't understand it. It makes no sense. It does not compute with them. They are cynical. I was talking with a person the other day who was having a conversation with an elderly person they know, knew, and this elderly person asked this young person, you don't really believe that when you die, you'll rise again, do you? And this young person said, yeah, I believe that's what Jesus has, has taught us, and that's what Jesus shown us through his resurrection. Well, I don't believe it, the person said. Um, Conversations like that break your heart. Verse 44. Uh, oh, we, we finished that part. Jesus is, it says in verse 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? Remember, the, the, the Pharisees have already decided on the sentence. They're just looking for the crime. They've already decided on what is a basis for excommunicating Jesus. They just want to find the sin. And they're never able to find it. They never come up with a plausible reason. They kill him because they want to kill him. Verse 48. Although he, by the way, they wouldn't be able to kill him if Jesus hadn't let them do it. Because it happened, his death happened at the Kairos moment, the moment decided by God. All right. Verse 48, the Jews answer him, answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Boy, that's insulting. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Notice he doesn't say a word about Samaritan. Jesus doesn't consider it an insult to be called a Samaritan because he loves all people. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. This is another way of him saying abiding in his word. If we continuously return to Jesus in what Luther calls daily repentance and renewal, the Father will save us. Uh, Jesus will save us. The Father will never judge against it. We will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me. Of whom you say he is our God but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say to you that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? 
Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So if the minority, uh, the less well attested manuscripts are right as to how this chapter begins, it begins with people wanting to stone a woman and it ends with people wanting to stone Jesus. It says something about how he bears the sins of the world. And it also says to me that the incident with the woman caught in adultery is probably authentic and we shouldn't worry too much about it. Also for Jesus to say, as we've already pointed out in uh, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am, is about as stunning a claim as possible. Um, and as I mentioned last night, when you confront this claim from Jesus, C.S. Lewis says you got to choose. Is he a madman? Is he a liar? Or is he who he says he is? And notice Jesus eludes being stoned to death, not because he's afraid of death. He's came, uh, come into the world to die, but because it is not, it is not his time. It is not his hour. Tomorrow, we'll get into chapter 9, and we will meet one of my favorite characters, true characters, uh, in the Bible. Um, any prayer requests, go ahead and jot them in the comments if you want to. I'll give you a moment to do that. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus has gone through not just the agony of the cross and rejection of people, but these kinds of confrontations in which his own people, not just Jews, but the human race, spurn him, reject him. And yet, he stayed to his task. He stayed to his call to offer his life up for us and to bring us the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that we can come to you in Jesus' name and repent and be made new each day. We pray on this Maundy Thursday, Lord, that you would um, create within us a uh, a depth of gratitude that just springs out of us in acts of love and witness for the Savior Jesus to others. We pray too, Lord, that, um, that you would give your healing to Andre and to Ruth. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would bring healing to all who are suffering from this virus. We pray again, as we do every day, for those who are on the front lines in this fight. We pray for doctors and nurses who are dying because they're trying to save us. We pray for public health officials, officials elected officials. We pray for our country. We pray for our communities. We pray for our world that in this moment when we are confronted with the reality of our mortality, that we will recognize that we are slaves to sin without Jesus Christ and we cannot free ourselves. And we pray, Lord, once again, that you would free us and send your empowering, enlivening spirit that we might live for you alone today and for all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, good to see those of you I, who I was able to see or participating this evening. Uh, 
Uh, everybody give their families hugs if they're there quarantined with you. Um, <laughs> otherwise, stay at a safe distance. Love God, love neighbor. Stay at home. Uh, God bless you all. Blessed Maundy Thursday. Bye now.